So um, I prepared those slides for a webcast uh, uh, on O'Reilly with uh, Andreas Muller, who is also one of the maintainers of the Scikit-learn library. Uh, but because we just have 20 minutes, I cut most of his slides because I don't know what he was talking about. Uh, all right. Um, so just I want, I want to uh, quickly introduce uh, the Scikit-learn project. So it's a machine learning library uh, written in Python and for Python developers. Uh, how many of you do not know Scikit-learn here? Don't. 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 Oh, there was more than expected. OK. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, the, the, the goal of Scikit-learn is to, uh, to, to make it easy to do predictive modeling, uh, as was introduced previously, um, with in-memory data structure. So it's basically non-scalable <laughs> predictive uh, modeling or machine learning. So this project started uh, in 2010, or we did the first release in 2010. And uh, since then, it, were, it, it grows in terms of uh, contributors. So it's an open source project. Now it's hosted on GitHub. And so we, for the new release that we try to do every one to six, mo to six months of uh, proximity, uh, we had 160 unique contributors. Uh, and uh, on the website, uh, those are the statistics from Google Analytics. So unique visitors, unique users on the website uh, per month, it's approximately 150. Uh, unique users per month. Uh, so quickly, machine learning uh, in scikit-learn. Um, so you start from the training data. Uh, if you are doing supervised machine learning, you, you want to predict some interesting values. So for instance, uh, whether or not a user will click on an ad. On an ad. Uh, so you need to collect both the input data, the description of the, of the users, the ad, the environment, and whether or not the past users had clicked or not on, on, on that ad. Uh, so in scikit-learn, uh, we do that by importing a model, so model class here. And we give it some parameters, uh, a dictionary of parameters with possible default values. And those are called hyperparameters uh, in machine learning, because we like fancy words. Uh, this is just by opposition of the internal parameters of the model that are trained from the data. So the user parameters and the data parameters are different. Um, so these, those are the, the parameters that the user selects. Uh, then we pass the input data, the training data. So in, uh, we are dealing uh, with Python uh, with NumPy data structures, so NumPy array. So X is an input array in two dimensions. The columns are descriptors and the rows are samples, individual uh, cases. And Y is a, is a, um, uh, a sequence of uh, labels of target values uh, for each row in, in the X table, basically. Um, then the model is updated, updates its internal parameters from the data, and it's able to make, new pre to pre to make predictions on new data, so the test data, and to produce some prediction. And in general, you want to know whether or not you're predicting something that is better than chance. So you want to compute the accuracy of your prediction uh, by uh, comparing them to uh, a, a ground truth uh, test labels that you manually annotated, for instance. Uh, so this is the scikit-learn API, basically. So there are many different models uh, as model classes, uh, but they tend to follow the, a very similar API so that you can try uh, to switch them and, and see how it goes and compare their accuracy. So you have many applications. Uh, I'll skip that. You know probably about that. Uh, so in, in the latest release, uh, we introduced a bunch of uh, interesting new features. So the f one of the first one that is kind of unique to uh, machine learning libraries is what we call uh, probability calibration. Uh, when you train a classifier, uh, sometimes the classifier can give you uh, an estimate of its confidence level. But mo most of the time, it, it lies to you. It, it's not the raw confidence level doesn't mean anything. A good confidence level will mean that if it is at 0.8, uh, from all of the, um, the classification that are made at 0.8 uh, confidence level, 80% of them should be correct, should be positive, for instance. Um, this, this would be a calibrated uh, confidence level. So most scikit-learn uh, classifiers, they have a predict probability method, predict proba, uh, but the, the, the raw prediction value is cheap to compute, but it's not necessarily good. 
So by using an external calibration tool, we can fix this. So to, di to diagnose whether or not your model is well calibrated, what you can do is do a calibration plot such as this one. And uh, in Scikit-Learn, we provide tools to, uh, to make that easy uh, with Matplotlib. So on the x-axis, you have uh, the, the, cal the confidence level predicted uh, uh, by the model for a, a bin of the, the data set. And on the y-axis, you see in each of those bins, the fraction of positive classification. So here, this is a support vector machine. So it's a linear model that tries to focus, uh, its decision function tries to focus on samples that are hard to classify. So you can see that the, the most, for most of the prediction it makes, they are close to 0.5, so it's not very confident. Uh, because it, it's straight to, to focus on the hard cases, and uh, then uh, therefore is not very confident of uh, its own classifications. Uh, in, in real life, uh, if you see from uh, all the samples that are predicted at 0.6 uh, confidence level, most of them are correct, actually. So it's very pessimistic. Um, so the, you cannot really use that as a probability of good classification because most of the time it's making very good classification w uh, even when it says that, that it's, not, it's not very confident. Uh, on the other hand, if you take logistic regression, uh, it's naturally a probabilistic model that directly tries to estimate uh, this probability. Uh, so you see that by default it's well calibrated. Uh, the accuracy is not necessarily better, it can be exactly the same as the previous model, but it's calibrated by default. Um, and you can see that uh, most of the examples here uh, and here, they are close to the 100% um, uh, uh, or 0% uh, uh, confidence level. Uh, so here I compare uh, logistic regression, the blue line, which is well calibrated, uh, support vector machine, the red line, which is not calibrated in, in, a, in a pessimistic way, and uh, naive bias, which does the uh, a mistake also, but the opposite mistake of, of support vector machine. You can see that it's overly confident, uh, even when it's making mistake. Uh, <laughs> so you shouldn't really not trust it. It's naive uh, for that reason, uh, among other things. Uh, we, we generated some data to, to make it fail also, so um, it's maybe a hard problem in that case. Uh, so it's possible once you have identified that your model is not well calibrated to, to use different uh, calibration methods. One is called the sigmoid calibration, uh, the plat method. So it's a parametric method, so it's good when you don't have a lot of data. Uh, and it's specifically designed to address the, the issue of the support vector machine, so the, the pessimistic uh, models. Uh, isotonic calibration is a second method that doesn't make that assumption, uh, but on the other hand, it's more data to, to calibrate the model correctly. Uh, so you, if, you, if you take the support vector machines, uh, the original uh, model is, is still the, the S shape, the sigmoid shape uh, calibration curve, the blue curve, and you can see that both the red uh, calibration, which is isotonic, and uh, green calibration, which is sigmoid, are kind of moving the model towards the diagonal, so well-calibrated model. So you can see that there is a, an actual uh, off-diagonal element here, but we, we discovered that there was a bug in the release, so we fixed it in masters, not yet released yet, but uh, <laughs> it's actually a bug. Um, and this one too. Uh, so for naive bias, you see that the, the, the sigmoid mo uh, parametric model does not fails completely to, to calibrate the, the model because it's making an assumption that is not true for the naive base model, whereas the isotonic calibration method uh, does not make that, that assumption and kind of work, uh, uh, except the bug. But, uh, <laughs> it's going to work better. Uh, so why would you like to calibrate? Uh, in most situations, you don't really care about the, uh, the confidence level. You really care about the, the accuracy, the, 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 percentage, the percentage of the time that the model makes a, a correct prediction. But for some specific situations, it's very important to calibrate, especially if your target uh, prediction uh, it directly relates to, the, to your business metric. So for instance, if you are doing uh, um, ad uh, auctions on uh, real-time bidding uh, platforms, uh, you want to estimate uh, the, the bid price, and to do so, you can 
you know uh, the cost per, per click, and what you want to do is estimate for a specific user and a specific ad the, the click-through rate, uh, the, the, the probability of click. And this is the real probability that you want to, to calibrate because it's directly related to, to the price that you want to, to bid on the auction. Um, in most situations, if you're really interested in that, you can also decide to just use a calibrated model like logistic regression instead of trying a non-calibrated model and recalibrating it afterwards because it's expensive and it's cheaper to directly train calibrated model in the first place. So think about that before calibrating. Um, then in scikit-learn 016, there is also uh, some, a lot of improvements uh, to make clustering algorithm more scalable. So, for instance, uh, we have one implementation of dbscan, which is a very nice algorithm uh, that kind of scans the whole data, data set, and for each sample, we'll build a neighborhood of uh, samples that are close, to, uh, points that are close to, uh, to it in a fixed radius, and identify points that have more than five uh, neighbors, uh, they will label them as, as core points, and those core points are interesting because they might be an important part of a cluster. And they, it will expand the clusters around the, the, those core, point, core points. Uh, if you have a, a good way to index the distances, and, and we have some in scikit-learn, the complexity of this algorithm is n log n, which is kind of scalable. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is the outline of the algorithm. So if, let's say, for instance, you, you start uh, from B. Uh, this is not uh, a core point because there is no, uh, if the minimum number of points is uh, two in that case, uh, there is a single, one, a single uh, point in, in that region. Uh, so you move on to the next one and you identify that this is a core point. So you put it in a cluster and B is still a neighbor, so you include it in the cluster as well. And, and you propagate, and then you include all of those uh, in the same cluster, uh, but n is outside of the radius of any core points, so you label it as noise, and you leave it as noise. So it's very, an interesting feature of dbscan is that it can identify stuff that are outliers and, and leave them away and do not create clusters for noise uh, points, basically. Uh, another feature of uh, dbscan that is very interesting is that it's able to find uh, a separation boundaries between clusters that are non-linear, non-convex non clusters, uh, which can be useful, especially uh, in low-dimensional data, like uh, geo data, for instance. Uh, so in O16, we, we improved uh, the algorithm, um, uh, the implementation of, of that algorithm, and so uh, you can label hundreds of uh, thousands of samples without any problem in uh, less, almost uh, in the order of a second. So it's a 30 time uh, speed up compared to the previous implementation, which is uh, really naive in uh, several respects. Um, so I mentioned the pros uh, already. Uh, so uh, the ability to, to discard the noise and to uh, isolate non-separable cluster. And it's quite fast in general. So you can, with that algorithm, you can tackle a couple of millions uh, of points in a couple of minutes uh, with no problem. Uh, the, the cons is that it's not really scalable because you still need to compute, uh, you still need to have an index of, of the whole data set, and to have this index work fast, it needs to be in memory. At least in scikit-learn, we just have an in-memory implementation of those indexes. So if your data doesn't, does not fit in memory, we have implemented another algorithm, which is called Birch. Uh, and Birch is an algorithm that will scan the data, and incrementally maintain a summary of the whole data set. Um, and it preserves enough statistics on the centroid locations, the, the cluster locations, so that uh, uh, you can do a final clustering at the end uh, without uh, keeping the whole data set in memory. Um, so in practice, in scikit-learn, it, it, like, it looks like this. So you create the model, so Birch, as usual, but it, instead of calling fit on the full data set directly, you will iterate over a data source that, that will give you chunks of data one at a time, and you will call partial fit uh, on each chunk on the, on the same model by iterating of the on the full data set. Uh, so this uh, full data set can be uh, several millions or billions of uh, samples. It would just take longer, but it will use a constant memory size. At the end, you can see that Birch uh, has a subcluster centers, which is a compressed representation of the of the full data set. 
And finally, we have a like a weird API to, to trigger the, the final clustering by setting the number of clusters that you want to extract out of that summary and call partial fit, partial fit once more without any data. And it, that will trigger the global clustering. And then you can use it to compute prediction uh, uh, on new data. Uh, if, if you want to uh, change the number of clusters, uh, you can change that at the end. You don't need to rescan the full data set. So it, it's very quick to recluster the, the final. Uh, cluster. Um, so here is an example of the behavior of Birch on a uniform data set in 2D. So a perfect clustering will be like a um, uh, checkerboard. Uh, and you can compare this uh, to mini batch k means on, on, uh, on the right, which is another out of core algorithm uh, for clustering in, uh, in scikit-learn. Uh, but this does not maintain the intermediate uh, data structure. So if it makes mistakes at the initialization time at the beginning, it tends to retain those mistakes. Whereas with Birch, uh, as the final clustering is done at the end on the summary, it can, it can fix and get a better clustering uh, than mini batch k-means. Uh, so what's next? Uh, there is a, an ongoing pull request in scikit-learn to implement some neural nets. So we didn't have neural nets until now. Uh, so we have the constraint in that project that we don't want to introduce a dependency on GPU or CUDA, which is often very, uh, necessary for very large neural nets nowadays. Uh, but we want to keep scikit-learn like a, an easy to go library. If you really want to do uh, deep learning uh, and do research on that in computer vision, I would advise you to, to buy a GPU or several and to use uh, Torch, Theano, or Cafe, which are libraries dedicated to that. But if you really just want to, to benchmark a baseline linear model on your data and compare it to a random forest, uh, to just to know whether or not uh, neural nets uh, could be promising or not on your data, uh, then this implementation might be uh, enough. Uh, and we have a simple hyperparameter set in the constructor, and it follows the traditional feed predict API of scikit-learn. So it's much easier to use than uh, Theano or, Th or Torch or Cafe, for instance. Uh, we plan the two optimizers. Uh, one optimizer, which is good for small data, which is called LBFGS, which has no hyperparameter for the optimizer, so it's easier to use. And if your data doesn't fit in memory, uh, we also implement SGD with no store of momentum with the partial fit API that we, we've seen with Birch, the same way to scan over the data even if it doesn't fit in memory. Um, and we try to provide reasonable initialization of the weights, which is very tricky uh, to get right. So we try to, to follow the state of the art. Uh, there is another in final interesting feature in scikit-learn, which is useful for uh, visualizing high-dimensional data in 2D, um, which is called TSNI. I will skip the math. Uh, but wh what is interesting is that when you want to compute the, the previous formula, uh, you have to compute the pairwise uh, a gradient that dep depends on all the possible pairwise distances between the, uh, the elements of your data set. Uh, basically, what the barnes hood approximation that we are implementing right now does is that it, it ignores uh, points that are, uh, that are too far away from one another to, to compute that gradient using a, a quad tree data structure that makes it possible to find uh, which points are, are, are too far away from one another very efficiently. And uh, basically, that reduces the, scale, the, the complexity of the algorithm from a, a, a quadratic complexity to n log n, which is much, much better especially when you go uh, above uh, 10,000 of samples. Uh, so it makes it possible to uh, run it on MNIST quite easily. Um, so this is the calibration, the, not calibration, the scalability curve of the new implementation in red compared to the standard implementation that we already have in the last release. And this is a logarithmic scale on the y-axis in seconds. So you can see that it stays below a couple of minutes whereas the other would move to the hours and days uh, quite quickly. Uh, so this is the kind of representation that you get on MNIST. Uh, so uh, the, the different colors are uh, different uh, points from different digits for uh, a digit recognition data set. I don't have time to explain or show more. Uh, but basically to, to get such nice clusters to identify the, the region of your data set, it's really hard to do on that data set. If you use something called PCA, which is the traditional way to do it, uh, you would see uh, a lot of overlapping uh, data. 
but uh, TSNI is able to use to focus on the local structure of the data set and identify th those regions this way. So it's a very nice way to explore a data set, especially if you uh, integrate that with Bokeh, and I think you might do a demo of that <laughs> later. Um, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>